We're going to start with the rather obvious questions. Why HEMA? Um, well, I, I kind of fell in love with it the, the first time I ever saw a treaties or a manual. I think I was, what year would it be? It was about 2003. I would have been 14 when I first went into high school. And uh, I ended up Google searching because I, I, I love like movies about swords like uh, Braveheart or uh, my favorite was Lord of the Rings. That's like a, my, my all time favorite still, still today. I was super into it. So I wanted to see if there was any, any way of fighting with uh, like Western swordsmanship. And uh, I ended up Googling it and I found uh, back then it was called the, the Arma. They're still around today. Uh, a little controversial of a group, but they had a bunch of uh, different treatises up. So the first one I think I saw was uh, probably a section of Talhofer's Messer, but then I found the Highland Broadsword uh, poster, uh, and I was, I was hooked on it from there, because it was something that seemed really straightforward to use, and uh, the basket-hilted broadsword is such like a cool classic weapon, uh, so I started practicing that. Um, I didn't have anybody really to train with other than uh, a, couple of, a couple of friends. Uh, but eventually a HEMA club opened up here in Winnipeg called uh, Valor Historical Fencing. And so I trained there a couple of years, but it was focused on rapier. And at the time it was very like SCA rapier, so there was limitations on the types of cuts you could do. It was more like drawing cuts, but we did do uh, historical work and I found a, a Salvatore Fabrice manual online from Tom Leone. Bought it, started working from the manual myself. And in the class we were doing kind of like uh, Capo Ferro. And eventually I found out that the Cataran Society had an online program uh, that you could join because I was training rapier, but really what I really, really wanted to train was a Highland Broadsword because I fell in love with those posters. So I ended up getting coached by Chris uh, for uh, a lot of years and, and the rest is history. I opened up, opened up a club in 2010 and uh, we've, we've uh, grown into where we're at today. How many members are there now, give or take? Uh, not including myself, I think there's 13 that are signed up for our current session. Numbers are kind of up and down because it's, it's winter on who's attending, but that's how many are signed up for it. During the summertime, you practice out in the fields? Yeah, a lot of times we'll practice outdoors. Uh, it's kind of a way of, of getting people to notice us. So we'll go to like uh, the Forks, um, kind of a popular place, or we'll go into the field here. And actually, that's how we've had some longtime members find us, like uh, Jacques. Uh, you know, the people that are watching on YouTube will know him as Spider Man because of his painted mask. Um, he ended up just biking by and he was like, Hey, are you guys doing Hema? And he had seen it on YouTube. I don't know if it was Gallagher's videos or Matt Easton. He had heard of Hema. He knew right away. And, so, and people like driving by will actually know what Hema is, which is really cool. Um, that's the reason why we, we train outside mostly. We can train in the gym whenever we want. Being that HEMA is quite literally a fringe sport, um, and as you mentioned, Jacques went, went by and he saw it and he was kind of interested by it, um, do you see growth potential? Uh, yeah, like uh, when I started years ago, like 2003, there was like nothing. Like very few people were doing it, there was no equipment. It was mostly like uh, basket hilted Chennai, or the people were using for broadsword were like, um, we were using like a lot of wooden wasters back then that had no uh, flex in the thrust. Like gear was like moto, motocross gear, random gear, lacrosse gear, uh, kind of thrown together. Or like using like medieval renaissance, like gambeson, stuff like that. That's what I used before there were Hema jackets. And then uh, now there's like so much uh, growth in terms of like what you can buy, uh, in terms of resources for starting up a club. And um, like tons of events, like there's always events that are happening, uh, tournaments. Um, we're hosting an event called Broadsword 2019 in February. It's going to be awesome. How many participants are you expecting for your event? Um, I, I think there should be at least minimum of 40 participants that are coming. And it's from all over. Like we have people from the UK, um, people from the USA. Australia, Paul Wagner's coming, um, and like really, really good uh, instructors. Some of them have been doing it for like 20, 20 plus years. So that makes the event actually that's coming up with 40 participants from around the world actually quite significant for Winnipeg then. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the first event that's happening in Winnipeg, and there's actually going to be another one come spring that uh, Chad uh, from Valor, uh, the place that I started off doing rapier, 
Uh, we're still on great, great terms together. I go fence with them, uh, Rapier. Um, he's hosting a tournament at an event called KeyCon, and it's going to be like a mixed, weapon, mixed steel and longsword. So uh, Winnipeg's kind of becoming, uh, as, as we're more collaborating between the clubs, getting tournaments going, uh, it's definitely like a, a place to, to look out for. So the benefit of things like YouTube, like what we're using or potentially using at the moment, if this footage turns out, yeah. <laughs> I am I am experimenting with a supposed steady cam. We'll see how steady it is. Okay. Um, I guess that's been a great benefit to you then. Yeah, it, it has been hugely. Like that's part of how I, I was assisted in learning it. Like of course I went to train with people in person as well, but part of how I was assisted in learning was through YouTube interpretations of the manuals. And then uh, over the years I've, I've kind of developed a, a good sense of what, what they're meaning to say just because uh, not too many people are using the sources that uh, we use. So there's not a ton of people to bounce ideas off of, like compared to like the German sources or uh, like rapier sources, they've been studied for a long time very thoroughly. Broadsword is kind of like, a, a, yes, people were working on it for a long time, but uh, I don't think they had a lot of eyes on it. So we're learning more and more about it all the time. There's new sources that uh, are being discovered, like uh, Ben Miller's book that we're using in class today. It's awesome to use that. <laughs> you were saying that you received it today and you've already devoured it? Yeah. Uh, instantly, yeah. I, I read it all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, this this comes the important part. Would your wife describe this as an addiction? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Like, yeah, but uh, like I put my family first. Yeah. 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 That's the way it goes. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks.